Fire service requirements debuted just about 37 years ago in the 1973B addenda to the 1971 edition of A17.1. From its humble beginnings, this portion of the code has grown from about 22 rather simplistic requirements to about 116 requirements. During the elevator code's evolution, the design and operation of elevators operating under Phase 1 and Phase 2 operation have become more prescriptive. It is likely that this section of the code will continue to be revised and appended over time as new concepts and technology emerge, making use of elevators for firefighters' emergency operation safer and more effective. This first presentation will focus on the early requirements of firefighters' operation as it was some 37 years ago. We will then compare that with today's requirements to give you a then and now view of firefighters' emergency operation. Under the 1973B edition of the code, elevators having a travel of 25 feet or more were required to be provided with fire service operation. Similar to today's requirements, a three-position keyed switch was required to be provided at the main floor. The positions were to be labeled on, off, and bypass. However, the code did not specify any particular order. Thus, they may be found in any order just so long as the three functions are present. Much like today, the elevators under control of this keyed switch must recall to the main floor. Note that the designated level was referred to as the main floor. It should also be noted that there were no requirements for alternate floor recall. When the keyed switch is turned to the on position, the elevator will be recalled to the main floor. Elevators traveling away from the main floor must stop at the available floor without opening its doors and then proceed non-stop to the main floor. Elevators with power operated doors and stopped at a floor with the doors open must close the doors immediately and move to the main floor. Door reopening devices susceptible to smoke must be rendered inoperative. Directional lanterns all registered car and hall calls must be extinguished and will remain inoperative. Once the doors are closed and the elevator begins moving toward the main floor, the stop switch in the car must be overridden. It should be noted that in most elevators of this vintage, keyed switches were not required for the in-car stop switch. This requirement deals with fire alarm initiating devices, commonly known as sensing devices under this edition of the code. Rule 211.3A1F states that detectors or sensing devices are not allowed to be used in lieu of the five previous requirements. In the 1973B addenda, detectors were also required at each elevator lobby except the main floor. There were no detectors required in elevator machine rooms or hoistways by this version of the elevator code. Activation of a lobby sensing device would cause all elevators that serve that lobby to return to the main floor and open their doors. The bypass position would allow the elevators to operate in normal mode regardless of the state of the sensing devices. Some exceptions to sensing device requirements were in buildings that were completely sprinklered, freight elevators with openings into manufacturing areas, and lobbies at unenclosed landings. Unenclosed landings are those that are open to the outside atmosphere. There was also a provision for instances where an elevator did not serve a grade level landing. It must recall to another approved landing in the building. The recall requirements are identical to elevators recalling to a grade level floor. Elevators with a travel of 70 feet or more and any elevators having a terminal landing that is more than 70 feet above the lowest grade of the building was required to be provided with a special keyed switch located in the elevator car. The key is similar in labeling and operation as the keyed switch located at the main floor. This switch is only operable when the main floor keyed switch is in the on position. The car must also have been recalled to the main floor for the switch to work. The key is removable only in the off position. The bypass position must be spring-loaded. When turned to this position, the key must be held in the bypass position. This will allow the elevator to operate with the hoistway door interlocks and the gate switch bypassed. 
However, travel is limited in the direction of the main floor or approved level only. It should be noted that the bypass position in the hall keyed switch and the bypass position in the elevator car keyed switch perform different functions. When the switch is in the on position, the elevator can only be operated from someone in the elevator. It cannot answer hall calls. Opening of the elevator doors is accomplished by constant pressure push button only. As with today's code, if the door open button is released before the doors are fully open, the doors will start to close immediately. Door close can be initiated by either pressing the door close button or by pressing a car call button. Unlike today's requirements, it is important to note that the language did not require maintaining constant pressure on the door close button or car call button in order to have the doors close completely. Multi-deck elevators that serve two floors simultaneously are required to meet certain criterion, although there are some practical differences. They are required to have a three-position keyed switch located at the main floor. It must comply with the requirements for sensing devices. It must be able to be recalled to the main floor or other approved floor. If the elevator has a travel of 70 feet or more, it must be equipped with a three-position keyed switch in the car. And finally, the keys for the main floor switch and the in-car switch must be the same. It should be noted that the location of the means in the corridor is not specifically mentioned. It is interpreted that the means would most likely be located adjacent to the lower level entrance. Keys to operate the main floor keyed switch and the in-car emergency operation switch must be the same and there needs to be a key for each keyed switch. Thus, if there are four elevators in the group, there needs to be a total of five keys. A key for each elevator and one for the keyed switch at the main floor. The keys must be kept on the premises, but not where they are accessible to the general public. Elevators on attendant operation or that can only be operated from the car must be provided with visual and audible signals to alert the attendant to return the elevator to the main or other approved floor. The same means may be used to alert the attendant when recall is activated by a sensing device. It should be noted that there are no specific design requirements for this visual means. Elevators with automatic and attendant operation must operate as previously mentioned for attendant operated elevators. When on automatic mode, they must operate as required by rules for automatic elevators. It should be noted that attendant operation includes independent and hospital service also. Instructions are required to be provided that indicate the operation of elevators under fire and other emergency conditions. The instructions must be incorporated in the enclosure for the main floor keyed switch with lettering not less than a quarter of an inch in height. It should be noted that the specific language required for the instructions was not part of the code at this time. Finally, testing of fire service operation is required to be performed on routine and other required tests. There are now about five times as many requirements as was first introduced in the 1973 B Addenda to the 1971 edition. With the next segment of this presentation, we will take you to the present and illustrate fire service operation under the 2008 Addenda to the A171 B44 2007 edition.